Okay. Now we are going to start uh, the second part of this afternoon. Okay, we have the presentation on the monitor. Um, the, the first uh, speech uh, of the, this second part uh, is the speech of Marta Bosina. Uh, the topic is privately uh, versus sovereign issued digital currencies. Marta Bosina, as I told you before, uh, is professor at the University of uh, Pola. The floor is your Marta. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Santoro, and um, good afternoon to all. And I want to, of course, thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to join you today um, at this virtual conference. Uh, and at the same time, I do hope that there will be an opportunity to think of some sort of a follow-up event in Siena, where we can meet in person and exchange um, our views on the topic of EU security that um, in the last um, in the last months, but also in the last period, has been uh, undergoing far-reaching transformations caused not only by the recent crisis. So I would have said I will now start sharing my slides, but as you know, I'm having this problem of of software and of technical uh, some technical issues. So uh, Professor Ventura, thank you for for helping out and. Um, I will talk today about um, European security, EU, law, uh, EU security law from a different perspective. Um, namely, European security is indeed very current and therefore it has been widely discussed by scholars and practitioners alike in the European Union, uh, with perhaps migration and data protection taking the, uh, taking the preeminence uh, in these discussions as we have seen uh, uh, yesterday and today also. But in this session, uh, however, we focus, as you know, on financial transactions and capital flows wherein security concerns, um, at least from my perception, touch upon a wide variety of issues such uh, that are mainly linked to financial system credibility and safety, um, such as, for instance, um, legal certainty of intangible assets um, or the security of financial collateral, uh, anti-money laundering concerns, and so on. And I think that all of these contested issues actually perfectly coalesce uh, in the topic of virtual currencies or privately issued digital currencies, since they clearly illustrate the multifaceted uh, security challenges um, that EU law regulations, rules and policies um, have to address and to respond to in a digitized economy. So, um, uh, for the next slide, if I may, um, if I may just uh, ask, thank you. Um, all the virtual currency remain a controversial phenomenon. Over the last decade, we have nevertheless witnessed um, their well exponential or steady growth. Um, in their number and volume, uh, with virtual currencies actually positioning themselves in the perception of the public as a natural competitor to digital money formats. And the ecosystem of virtual currencies today is really vast and varied, uh, but for the purpose of my discussion, as you know, I focus on privately issued digital currencies because they um, uh, gather and they um, comprise all the virtual currencies' main traits. Um, they are, for instance, electronically transferable digital representations of value, uh, because of which they can appear as fierce competitors with the more innovative money formats issued by um, sovereign established authorities. Uh, at the same time, PIDICs are not issued by a public authority or attached to a fiat currency, which at the same time doesn't prevent them to be accepted as a means of exchange between parties that are willing to do so. Uh, I mainly build my discourse and my argumentation in reference to bitcoins um, and its features. And of course, I'm aware that there is a vast variety of other virtual currencies and cryptocurrencies around, such as Ethereum, Ripple, or Tether. 
But Bitcoins remain one of the most widely used virtual currencies in the European Union. And also the technology behind Bitcoins shows potential to advance innovative money formats, but also at the same time to trigger some substantial and very important security concerns. Moreover, in a digitized, um, in a digitized payment environment uh, that could potentially turn into a cashless society sometime in the future, uh, the trust in money itself, as we know, hinges on the security um, and the trust in intermediaries and private retail infrastructures that actually develop and create uh, privately issued digital currencies. So for the next slide, I would like to touch upon some um, core contestations. Um, as a technology-driven financial innovation, um, sorry, I've just lost the slide here. Uh, BITX have the potential to transform our payment environments faster and, um, than ever before, but also in more disruptive manners. So um, to cite even Mersh from the European Central Bank, uh, especially in terms of consumer confidence and also uh, as well as the connection of virtual currencies and of private issued uh, digital currencies with illicit financial transactions. So with this in mind, the question really um, is whether central banks should consider providing some sort of digital currency, should they give in into this monetary competition, so to say. Um, such sovereign issue digital currencies or central bank digital currencies, so CBDCs, could compete with privately issued monies. And in this sense, in this competition, they will also enjoy a privileged position um, setting aside monetary policy concerns uh, that point to the fact how CBDCs um, uh, would actually um, lead to perhaps uh, uh, the ending of fractional reserve banking or to greater financial disintermediation, uh, a topic that I have previously discussed also in one of my papers. Today, my focus uh, turns to, very, to two very important regulatory concerns. Uh, first of all, uh, the issue of uh, anonymity and the issue of anti-money laundering. So if we conceive that central banks could engage with digital money, so issue central bank digital currencies, should they be anonymous? And if they are anonymous, how could central bank digital currencies meet the anti-money laundering requirements um, of the rules and legislation in the EU? Um, as I said in one of my earlier papers, I have uh, discussed CBDCs from the monetary perspective, uh, but uh, in this discussion, I would like to turn my attention to the regulatory ones and to do so by uh, touching upon two important developments from the institutional, but also um, policy um, aspect or regulatory aspect, so to say, in the European Union. I will discuss uh, the advancements made uh, by the ECB, the key institution in terms of central bank digital currencies, the potential to issue CBDCs in the European Union, and also from the perspective of the fifth uh, anti-money laundering directive. So for the next slide, I wanted to actually give um, kind of a primer or a reminder of what privately issued digital currencies um, are, what we are dealing with here. Um, so virtual currencies are defined by the fifth anti-money laundering directive for the first time as a means of digital representation of value that is not issued or guaranteed by a central bank or another public authority. And also it is not attached to a legally established currency, so it does not possess a legal status of currency or money, but is nevertheless accepted by natural legal persons um, as a means um, of exchange. Um, and they can also be transferred, stored and traded electronically. So from a legal perspective, we automatically know that PDX cannot be considered currency or a legal tender since first they lack the sovereign established authority uh, and relationship. This is a prerequisite that would encourage wider circulation in a community. And as for the status of legal tender, well, actually they lack a precise legal basis or legislative foundation that would allow them mandatory acceptance within a jurisdiction uh, and actually allow them to uh, be accepted as means to discharge monetary obligation between uh, parties. 
Uh, at the same time, pedics also lack, um, um, they do not meet some basic economic functions of money in the wider economic sense of the term, since uh, currently virtual currencies and pedics function exclusively as means of exchange. So this means of exchange should be understood more narrowly as a medium to exchange. Uh, because virtual currencies actually function as an intermediary asset um, in trade. So without the trader's um, own interest to use or consume virtual currencies, they actually uh, want to exchange them for other goods that have more intrinsic value to them. But what is interesting from my perspective uh, about PIDX is that their main intellectual premise is that they wish to eliminate the middleman or intermediary in the traditional money issuing and money creation uh, process, which is typically represented either by a central bank, so a sovereign established public authority, or by a financial intermediary, which abides again by specific prudential requirements regarding the licensing, authorization, transparency, and so on. And in this sense, PIDICs actually openly challenge um, the traditional legal and uh, political uh, paradigms of state control money creation processes, uh, fueling the competition between private and public provision of money. So, um, oops, I have lost connection for a moment here. Please excuse me again. Um, let me continue a bit, um, sorry, can I, can I just see the, I don't see my, my slides now, can I just, oh, thank you, okay. Just a moment, I've lost my, my, uh, my line of thought. So, um, with this slide, I wanted to turn your attention to some main um, regulatory concerns about PDX. Uh, let's consider, for instance, uh, Bitcoin, to which I referred my uh, discussion, as I said. So uh, this PDX directly challenges the money creation and uh, monetary policy role of the euro area uh, central banking system because it provides um, let me say an alternative form of currency to central bank liabilities circulating as, as currency. And also to commercial bank liabilities uh, backed by fractional reserves of central bank money that again circulate as book money in non-cash payment uh, systems. What should preoccupy us in this case in respect of PIDICS is not the erosion of the traditional stakeholders in the money creation process, so the erosion of the traditional middleman in the money exchange, uh, money creation process. Rather, it is the possibility of using bitcoins for illicit purposes, such as first, uh, because of the possibility of this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer transaction principle, uh, which in itself carries an intrinsic lack of supervisory mechanisms uh, over the multiple um, intermediaries, so to say, or stakeholders operating within the virtual currencies ecosystem. Secondly, uh, it preoccupies because of the possibility of anonymity or pseudonymity uh, that is offered uh, through PIDICS and through uh, transactions which actually also allow you to use Tumblr services which disguise your transaction histories, making it near impossible um, for um, money, anti-money laundering authorities or financial intelligence units to uh, use transaction data for law enforcement. Um, thirdly, uh, the irreversibility of transactions is also problematic uh, because uh, this makes PDX and virtual currencies per se very, um, very attractive for illicit, um, illicit purposes and um, financial crimes and such illicit activities, uh, especially in ransomware purposes. And fourthly, um, uh, PDX are problematic because, of course, they are immateriality, because of their flexibility of cross-border transfer. And uh, this, of course, complicates not only the possibility of determining the jurisdiction under which they operate, but also to, uh, to impose law enforcement. So the next slide, thank you. Um, so um, if PDX are so problematic, why then should we even think about central banks engaging and giving in into this monetary competition. 
Um, or in other words, could there be a silver lining to this problematic situation? Um, I would argue that there is a silver lining to the circumstances. Bidix, first of all, suggests that new opportunities for central banks exist in this heavily digitized pavement environment, uh, where first the monopoly of central banks over the money creation process uh, itself is not um, absolute, as you know. And this is because the majority of money in circulation today is already private, in a sense, uh, because it is created by banks as private entities through uh, the well-established process of deposit taking and credit multiplications. And secondly, the bulk of money issued uh, by uh, central banks is already digital. Uh, it is created through wholesale credit operation with financial intermediaries and with banks. However, uh, the access to central bank digital accounts uh, and thus to the digital forms of uh, money is limited exclusively to banks or financial intermediaries. What would be a game changer, again in the word of Yves from the European Central Bank, um, uh, is uh, the possibility of issuing retail central bank digital currencies that are available to a larger audience, to a larger public. So unlike PDX, central bank digital currencies would have the advantage or the upper hand of being backed by a sovereign established public authority, which is also supported by a clear legal framework, which maintains its credibility and also uh, stability and safety. Yet again, um, many uncertainties arise around central bank digital currencies, even if we conceive them in that perspective. And uh, the majority of which refer firstly to the legal basis of CBDCs. Um, CBDCs should have the same status, same uh, legal status as a legal tender. Um, and in this sense, also the same legal status, status enjoyed by banknotes and coins. But without legal tender status, the legal basis would need to be clarified as well as the relationship between CBDCs and banknotes and coins, along with the process for which one can be exchanged for the other. And the second also preoccupation or the second problematic aspect is the widely cited anonymity. Uh, retail central bank digital currencies could be backed by a decentralized ledger technology that is also not extraneous to uh, financial intermediaries today. That would allow for some degree of anonymity towards the central bank, which is similar to cash. But even if CBDCs might not guarantee complete anonymity, they would inevitably raise legal concerns about their potential um, and opportunity to be used for illicit transactions and activities. So for the next slide, I'm turning my attention and your attention to um, how uh, the European Union has responded or started to tackle this issue of um, anonymity uh, and of uh, anti-money laundering concerns also, connect, uh, concerns also connected to the virtual currencies through its enactment of the fifth anti-money laundering direct directive. From this aspect of illicit use, um, an important signal that the EU indeed is proactively working on a comprehensive legal framework for uh, virtual currencies is uh, the, the, the fifth enactment of the anti money laundering directive, sorry, from 2018. So the scope of uh, the anti-money laundering directive goes uh, beyond merely regulating virtual currencies. This directive really wishes to establish itself as one of the key building blocks within the broader EU security law and security policy in the context of um, sound cross-border financial transactions via innovative digitized money formats, which apparently are here to stay in the future. So in this sense, the anti-money laundering directive is important not only to limit the potential for VCs or virtual currencies illicit use, but it is also important because it increases legal clarity in this area. So this is the first time that, uh, uh, that some legal clarity has been introduced uh, within the broader field of virtual currencies. And this prompts the development of a wider legal uh, framework in the EU, as well as of specific national regulations that will target contentious issues uh, in reference to virtual currencies and PIDX. This is, of course, also very important from the perspective of potentially one day envisaging or developing uh, central bank digital currencies in the European Union. 
And indeed, the AML directive is one of the few regulatory responses to some of the more pressing security concerns uh, connected with virtual currencies, primarily, of course, anonymity and also this potential for their illicit uh, financial transactions. To this end, the directive has clearly addressed uh, key stakeholders in the virtual currency ecosystem uh, and it has been done so for the first time because they are instrumental to increases, increasing legal clarity and certainty as well as the possibility as well as of limiting the possibility to using virtual currencies for illicit purposes. Firstly, the AML directive, its fifth enactment, has addressed exchange services providers that allow the flow between virtual currencies and fiat currencies. And secondly, the AML directive has also addressed um, uh, custodian wallet providers that safe keep private cryptographic keys on behalf of virtual currency users. What the directive has not done, um, it did not, uh, for instance, uh, address uh, Tumblr services. So it did let leave some leverage and some maneuvering space for uh, member states um, to uh, address these specific stakeholders in their own uh, national legislation. Because of this, but also because of the uh, wording of the directive, um, uh, it has been deemed as too soft in its regulatory approach to anonymity, um, as well as, uh, as in its approach to some of the key stakeholders in the virtual currencies ecosystem by some European institutions, most notably the European Parliament. Yet from the perspective of central bank digital currencies, um, the, this fifth enactment of the uh, Anti-Money Laundering Directive um, encourages and complements the related work of key institutional actors in the European Union um, in this arena and in this field, chief among them, the European Central Bank. So in the next slide, I will talk uh, a little bit more about the institutional response of the ECB to virtual currencies. So you first have to understand that the ECB is coming at virtual currencies from a very, well, previously I might call it higher ground because they did not even want to address virtual currencies um, in, um, they, uh, in their uh, um, policy responses, uh, unlike the EBA, for instance, which uh, who pushed for a more proactive role. So uh, to uh, follow this, uh, the spirit of the ECB it is perhaps worth citing the again words of Yves Mersch from the ECB supervisory board, who stated that the ECB simply does not want to engage further with virtual currency, or it did not want to engage further with virtual currencies, since the ECB is technologically neutral. The ECB doesn't serve the technology, it is the technology that serves us, uh, he said. Moreover, considering the exponential surge in demand for cash during this uh, corona crisis pandemic that we have witnessed and are still witnessing, but especially during March 2020, the ECB was only, uh, has only consolidated its stance that there is not a clear business case to work on central bank digital currencies because the majority of European citizens still require and need and demand cash. Yet, this doesn't mean that the ECB doesn't consider policy implications of virtual currencies and PIDICs. In fact, the bank is actively exploring the possibility of central bank digital currencies, their optimal design and policy framework in order to get ready and to, uh, get, uh, and to get ready and to prepare itself to embrace technological innovations in a prudentially sound manner. So in this sense, uh, one of the main challenges addressed by the ECB's analytical work in this field has been the, how to strike the balance between a certain degree of privacy in electronic payments and how to comply at the same time with anti-money laundering regulations that are enacted and enforced in the European Union. In December 2019, the ECB made a very important step forward and a very, it has delivered a very important policy document, uh, which is published under the name of a proof of concept. Uh, in other words, this is a study that gathers evidence and opinions from researchers and practitioners in the context of exploring the possibility of a retail or general use CBDCs, as opposed to the wholesale CBDCs that the ECB already has, uh, is um, accustomed to in its relationship with the financial entities. The driving idea behind this proof of concept and this analysis is to envisage a simplified um, 
payment system for CBDCs that would safeguard users' privacy for low-value transactions while ensuring that higher-value transactions and transfers are still subject uh, to greater scrutiny of anti-money laundering authorities and also to the scrutiny of financial intelligence units. So on the next slide, I am uh, looking into and zooming into the Eurochain, a very um, tentative and working title for uh, one day the future, perhaps a future um, central bank digital currency of the Euro system. Uh, it uh, is a moniker that uh, has been named under the um, upon the Eurochain Research Network, which has delivered this proof of concept. Um, this research network seeks to foster a common understanding of distributed ledger technology, so the one that it also backs uh, bitcoins, and therefore a manner in which, in which these innovative technologies uh, and fintech in general uh, could be appropriated by public authorities in a prudentially sound manner. The proof of concept shows, first of all, that in a simplified environment, so to say, Distributed ledger technology can be used to balance an individual's right to privacy with the public interest uh, in, in the enforcement, in strict enforcement of anti-money laundering rules and regulations. The key, um, uh, the key feature, the key building block and the main deliverable of this proof of concept in my perception is uh, the development of uh, anonymity vouchers, which allow every user to be identified with a pseudonym uh, within a certain number of transactions in a specified time frame. Low value transactions are then automatically processed without revealing personal information to the central bank or to the intermediaries that can access central bank accounts for clients. At the same time, high value transactions that exceed the allowed amount of anonymous transfers are directly checked by anti-money laundering authorities who will oversee transaction data and ensure that they meet with uh, uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory standards and provisions. Hence, uh, instead of ECBs full of control of user information, Eurochain uh, allows us for a, specific, um, uh, for a specific form or type of anonymity, and this is controllable anonymity. Yet this is not a blueprint for the development of CBDCs in the future uh, or a blueprint to even taking concrete steps in that direction. It is just a step forward in exploring how blockchain technology, so the one that is being praised to be so innovative and uh, the one which makes bitcoins and PDX so attractive, could coexist in the European payments area and services in light of existing anti-money laundering uh, regulations. Let me conclude uh, with some with some final thoughts and actually uh, with some with some final remarks, but also with some food for thought because this, of course, is not an exhaustive research. It is some kind of a of a scoping research. So for the for the next slide, um, what to conclude on the subject of sovereign issued central bank digital currencies in the context of boosting security of financial transactions and flows in an increasingly digitized um, financial environment and payment environment. So PDX, of course, we are well aware of, can be used as a means in illicit financial activities, not least because of the many uncertainties connected with their conceptual and legal framing, but also because their driving idea is to allow a prominent degree um, of anonymity. It is what makes them so attractive for users. In this sense, also, uh, although there may not be a business case at this moment encouraging sovereign issue digital currencies, this does not preclude and shouldn't preclude relevant EU authorities to reflect on this issue and to reflect how exactly the legal framework can further be developed, especially in the field of anti-money laundering regulation. And secondly, how this innovative virtual currency technology could be appropriated to develop CBDCs for the public if the need arises in the future. From the perspective of AML regulation, I have to say that the fifth anti-money laundering directive with its definitions and provisions of newly obliged entities um, is a valid step toward a more detailed set of rules at the European level, uh, but also uh, it gives food for thought and some, uh, some, it encourages proactive legislative measures at the national level.
The real game changer, as we know, must come from the ECB itself. Uh, in the sense that we expect from the Eurosystem Monetary Authority to refine their position on CBDCs and also to encourage further policy and legislative work in the field, perhaps even coordinating with other relevant authorities that are being quite active in this area, such as the EBA. Considering the bank's long-standing stance of technological neutrality together with the fact that PDICs, in fact, are here to stay, uh, whether it will be for speculative or um, for investment purposes. And despite the risk they bring forward, it is important to demonstrate the bank's capacity to embrace financial technology innovation, not least because of preserving uh, confidence in the innovative money formats in the European payment area. So um, with this, I uh, conclude my presentation and I welcome any questions that uh, you may have on the topic. And thank you for the technical assistance and please excuse my, my technological incompetence on Google Meet. Thank, thank you, you, Mark, Mark. Yeah. For, for your, your very interesting remarks. Uh, uh, well, I would like to note uh, uh, only one thing, that uh, uh, historically, uh, the check has already served to increase monetary circulation in economies without enough money. I think that when control of monetary base is getting too careful today, then technology helps individuals to widen the monetary base. As you said, uh, there are uh, advantages, but also risks, for example, regarding risk of money laundering and terrorism. Mm. Uh, therefore, uh, the, uh, there, were, uh, there was a, a phenomenon, technical, but non-legal, completely new, completely new, in my opinion. I don't know if you agree with my, my remark. Uh, no, I would, I would agree. Um, I would agree with you on this remark. And I have to say that uh, the, uh, if you look at the, uh, the response of the ECB, it has uh, for long st stood its ground as very neutral to the uh, to, to virtual currencies and to the expansion of virtual currencies. Uh, but I think that what actually pulled it, uh, the ECB, in this uh, competition, in this monetary competition, was the technology behind it. And if you also look at the proof of concept that I've cited, so the first actually big policy deliverable uh, analytical work of the ECB on the issue of uh, privately issued digital currencies versus sovereign issued digital currencies, the majority of it is really devoted to te technical aspects. So for me, it was also uh, very hard to comprehend and grasp because, of course, as a lawyer and an economist, I was expecting some monetary uh, debates or, or points, some you know in-depth legal analysis, but actually what they focused was on the technology in itself. So I think that um, the ECB actually gave in to this monetary competition because of the attractiveness of the technology and because, as we have rightly noted before um, in, the, in, our, uh, in our session, uh, society and uh, society is changing. It is becoming more advanced in the technological terms and, of course, our payment systems are changing uh, accordingly. So I think that the, 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 main, uh, the main push forward for the ECB was technological, but I think that it's still, you know, the legal framework and the legal thoughts and the legal scholarship is still um, kind of la lagging behind. It has to keep up with the technology. So I'm still waiting for a more in-depth legal research or view on this issue, but uh, yes, I would, I would agree with your, with your observation. Thank you for your answer too. Then the last uh, speech, uh, the one of uh, uh, Cecilia Cardarelli, the topic is technological innovation <coughs> and security. The open banking, we have another point of view on open banking, of course. Uh, please, uh, Cecilia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vittorio. 
thank you all, the, uh, all organizers of this uh, meeting for having involved me and given me the opportunity to explore some issues uh, with all of you, which uh, on uh, the one uh, hand uh, are very complex, uh, while on the other are also very stimulating for uh, interdisciplinary aspects. I'm very honored to be part of a panel of experts like this. Uh, uh, well, I'll begin by stating that my discussion is not aimed at solving uh, the many problems that the subject of open banking poses, uh, but more simply, I, uh, I want more simply, I would like to share with you some brief reflection uh, on the aspect that seemed to me to be central to the achievement uh, of the objective of the preserving uh, the, legis the legis legislation, uh, guaranteeing the customer an efficient and secure service while using the internet channel. So, in order to do, I would like to accompany my presentation with the project of a few slides. Just a moment. Okay. Just a moment. Oh, I have a technical problem. Oh, it's okay? Eh, no, Cecilia, non, non lo vediamo. Sono Marco. Oh. Eh, allora è meglio che Isabella metta le slide, perché anche qui ci saranno problemi. E, professoressa, ora è riuscita a condividere lo schermo? No? No, no. Ok. So, thank you Isabella. Well, the Parliament Service Directive, the second Parliament Service Directive introduce, introduce many important innovations in the regulation of the Parliament system. The European framework attempts to coordinate technological development, uh, which inevitably uh, also affects the processes of the Parliament system, burdening the service offered with the objective of guaranteeing more and more secure transactions while at the same time increasing consumer trust in the operators. Uh, the next slide, please. First of all, we should keep in mind that the community regulation intends to achieve this objective through the framework of information service. To achieve this objective, the PSP2 extends the notion of payment service to include the service of the authorization of payment orders, payment initiation service, and the access to information regarding accounts mediated by third party, account information service. 
So next, uh, thank you. My speaker will focus uh, on the account information service uh, and in particular on the possible legal reconstruction of a three-party relationship between the customer and the third part providers and between customer account holder and the bank account holding institution, all based on legal transactions. Each relationship has different objectives and different parties and different causes. The former involves an in exchange and the latter a direct act of conservation of data. The presence of these contracts will consume, consume determines the effect of generating a relationship between third part providers, account information service providers, and banks' account holding institutions, whose object lies in the access to the information. There is only one element that, uh, no, no, uh, the. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, there is only one element. Uh, that units the two relationship that is the interface with which data access and transfer of said data to the consumer are carried out. So I ask myself in a provocative way, obvious, can information technology support a computer environment be the link between these two transactions I would like to start by pointing out uh, that in this trilateral relationship, we can identify two risk profiles uh, related to the acquisition of data and their processing. Uh, the next slide, please. The profile related to the security of access credentials. Oh, well, where is this detail? And two, second. The profile related to the protection of personal data. The former is related, in my opinion, both the problems connected uh, consumer behavior while using the set credentials and more technical ones concerning the software that generates the access to the same. In which case, I will limit myself by considering only the contents of the disclosure requirements of the third part providers. While the latter profile concerns the updating of the principle of the transparency of a payment transaction aimed at generating certainty of the transaction and of the extinction of the contractual relationship and which ultimately determines trust and security in consumers. It is exactly in this profile that I find greater uncertainty in the legal reconstruction of the source of the obligation and the parties concerned. First, what means access information? Access to data means exchange of information and therefore Falling information protection system focused on the Italian legal system in transparency of information processes and free access. So, uh, the next slide, please. The community framework fully embraces this interpre interpretation enshrining free access to database and indicates in the functionalization of data acquisition for the reconstruction of an overview of a consumer financial situation, the uh, selection criterion of the data to be communicated. Access takes place online and concerns aggregated data regarding one or more accounts held by different payment service providers. The use 
of open interfaces uh, allows cost to be limited and creates a real network for data circulation. Hence, uh, it can easily be deduced that the account information service uh, being a trilateral relationship creates a flow of information between the bank and the account information service providers, which provides the consumer with information regarding his current financial position. On a legal level, there is a need of, for rules aimed at guaranteeing the confidentiality of this uh, same data, which is to be circulated among several subjects. The regulation includes uh, obligation for both account information service providers and banks. So the next slide, please. In particular, the bank that holds the account is required to provide access to the payment and accounting data needed to assess the financial situation and in relation to the accounts previously identified by the consumer. Uh, the bank is required to allow access to data to subjects other than the owner, but only to well identify account information service providers. And the bank will need to develop a technological system that allow for the identification of the account information service providers. Uh, the next slide, please. The account information service providers required to acquire and process data and must transfer them to the consumer and must not keep them and or use them for purpose other than those indicated by law. In this way, the regulation finds a balance between the opposing interests, that of the confidentiality of the client accounting, accounting empowerment data, and that of a transparency of the service, offering adequate data protection. These obligations foreseen in the regulation are attributable to the contractual obligation assumed uh, in the two legally existing relationships, that between the consumer and the third party provider, and that between the consumer and the bank account holding institution. When opening the payment account, the bank take on the obligation to select the data relating to the account based on specific criteria that will be decided on by the parties themselves and that will respond to the consumer's need to have a complete and exhaustive picture of the payment status. As well, in the same contract, the bank may be obliged to allow third parties to access to the accounts. I would uh, add uh, legitimately and not indis indiscriminately to all third parties who might ask for it. At this point, it becomes important to identify the means of ascertaining this legitimacy which allows the bank to behave diligently as it complies with its obligations. I asked myself then what role technology may play in this context. The community framework regarding account information service is based on the principle of technology neutrality and therefore based on this assumption does not intervene in the regulation of the explication method of the service, leaving to the individual banks the choice of technology that is then most appropriate. The European Bank Authority in its guidelines and the Bank of Italy in the instruction indicate the principle of proportionality, a criterion for choosing the data access system suggesting two possible technical alternatives. First, 
the opening of an interface in the home banking environment already used by the consumer. Second, the opening of the interface dedicated to this service, the application programming interface. In first case, there are some problems, in this case related to the development of a way of interpreting the rules that uh, allows account information service to be included as an accessory service in home banking that I develop in my written text. Now I want to speak about uh, the possibility that account intervention in information service is released from any negotiation relationship. Uh, the absolute novelty of the directive is represented by the possibility to activate the account information service free of any contractual relationship linked to payment service. I mean that the legislation seems to allow for the creation, uh, the next slide please, uh, of an open source interface in which data coming from networks that do not belong to the same domain can be shared. Establishing an open source means that the individual company will make all the information necessary available for the interface to be used by interested parties regardless of whether or not there is a contractual relationship with them. From this, the US draws two conclusions. First, that regarding the autonomous relevance of the data sharing service. Secondly, the fact that the service itself is considered as open source implies not only respect for the principle of availability and no discrimination of access, but also respect for the rules that govern the use of the interface to guarantee the confidentiality of, that, of data and their correct aggregation. Uh, as far as access is concerned, the identification by the bank or the third party providers involved in, uh, or perhaps in illegal terms, we would better say legitimized to assess, is important in the provision of the directives. In other words, it is necessary to understand how the third party providers establishes a legal situation which allows them to request data from the bank and which obliges the letter to provide it. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. The directive does not require the third party providers have specific structural uh, characteristic, uh, even if they must be authorized by national authorities. It only specifies uh, the obligation in order to protect the consumer to take out an insurance policy or other suitable guarantee to cover the risk derived from the activities provided, which pertain to the acquisition of data and their processing. However, it should be noted that the prerequisite for assessing the interface is to have obtained the authorization to provide payment service from one's competent authority. So anyone meeting the qualification requirements for payment service can perform account information service. Therefore, the principles that govern the payment service are the key to interpreting, inter, interpreting the meaning of the obligation imposed on such provider. I should remind me in particular of the security of access credential to consumer accounts, for which the consumer himself is responsible, and uh, the respect of the privacy right for which the data holder is responsible. This protection needs are updated in the regulation, which on the one hand provides the requirement that the third party providers acquire prior consensus of the consumer. 
I could also add expressly and specifically for the access to the accounts through the use of personal credentials and processing of his data. The object of the manifestation of consent is the information regarding the credentials of their personal nature and their end use aimed at, at uh, acquiring the necessary information. This brings uh, to my mind an expression, namely that of informed consent. The payment service consumer must, in fact, be aware of the characteristic of the account information service, even the technical ones, of the risk involved in the use of interface, and of the safeguard of confidentiality adopted by the account information service providers. In other words, we are talking about detailed pre-contractual information necessary to guarantee the consumer receives the correct information to decide whether to adhere or not adhere to the relationship with the provider. A contractual scheme which exclusively relates to the transfer of accounting and payment data in aggregate form and which present risk profiles that concern confidentiality due to the instrument used. We can consider the ECH in this regard. I remind myself that the objective of the account information service are sensitive data and that therefore the rules of their transfer or processing must be coordinated with the general data protection regulation, which establishes the right to data protection as a fundamental right of a person. In this pers perspective, the protection of an account information service consumer's privacy will focus on the accountability of the account information service providers, which will have the task of adopting the appropriate behavior in order to guarantee confidentiality. From this uh, complex information, uh, information uh, structure, the account information providers uh, could be responsible, we are, here uh, we must use the conditional, both in, in the case in which the necessary information has not been provided, which would allow the consumer to make a well-informed decision, and in the case in which the same consumer is not allowed to return to the disaggregate data. The choice of uh, regulation number 389 of uh, 2013 of the Commission is interesting. Uh, and I'm going uh, to the end, which defines uh, the unique communication standards for all providers of payment services in order to make it easier and safer to communicate even between banks and account information service providers. However, uh, we can uh, uh, see the next uh, slide, please. Uh, the communication security cannot disregard the identification of third party providers who are entitled to assess data in order to avoid uh, on the one hand, that the same bank incurs contractual liability towards the consumer for whom it is obliged to keep the accounting and payment data confidential. And on the other hand, to protect the user of the service from possible claims related to non-disclosure of the security credentials, which are personal another contractual obligation, this time taken on, by, uh, taken on by the consumer. Moreover, for the third part providers, uh, the identification represents the certification of the eligibility of the subject to carry out uh, account information service, both in terms of technical choices, uh, 
made to guarantee security and integrity in the transmission of data and in terms of the origin of the same. According to the regulation, this identification occurs through, through the release of digital certificates by qualified professional, qualified trust service providers. Certification, therefore, represents a key moment of the entire information transfer process because it legitimizes the account information service provided in its request and obliges the bank to allow access to the data. The complexity of the system opens itself to several problems. We could, for example, reflect on the logic of the certification of the account information service is offered by the bank itself. It seems to me that I can be said that this certification is characterized by a supervisor logic and that it could become a competitive factor to, spend, to be spent in the payment system. Here, a new path would open and need to be explored. In conclusion, I limit myself to highlighting an aspect that I think is significant in order to ensure and guarantee consumer and efficient service without any loss in securities and confidentiality data. I don't think that the contractual structure of the service allows the bank to verify whether or not there has been prior authorization of the consumer for acquisition of the data from his own accounts. The bank can only verify through the certification of the account intervention service, information service provider that the level of the security is sufficient and the confidentiality for, of the acquisition and transmission of data is guaranteed. I wonder if the bank can deny access to the accounts to an account information service provider with the necessary certification, but not previously authorized. The bank will not be able to carry out a further verification beyond that of checking the certificate a direct verification to confirm the existence of the consent and eventually to object that they lack the for and thereof and therefore justify the refusal of access in order to protect the confidentiality of the data. We can recall Article 5 of European Regulation number 679 of uh, 2016, which established uh, the general principle for the protection of the data privacy and which requires uh, that the old uh, guarantee adequate security. I wonder what level of security the bank can guarantee in the absence of the certainty of the consumer's consent. If prior consent can be equated with the, the legitimacy of the account information service provider, I believe it is necessary that the bank be able to verify, verify its existence, even if this kind of verification slows down the speed of the mechanism desired by the system discouraging the customer from the use of the service. Here we encounter the classic dispute between operational speed and, cert and certainly of legal situation, which also involves another aspect directly linked to this one. The fact that the regulation does not contemplate the rule for the withdrawal of consent. Freedom of choice, in my opinion, for the general principle of law concerns not only the moment of consent, but also necessary the amendment of that choice. The choice of the account information service provider is based not only on a purely technical assessment, but also 
on a fiduciary considerations. It is therefore logical to consider an eventual loss of that uh, previously expressed consent. Although there is no trace of European regulation regarding revocation, it is not conceivable that the consumer cannot revoke the consent given to the account information service provider. As not above, the situation is very delicate because uh, it involves non all, not only the consumer account information service provider relationship, but also the bank that is contractually obliged to ensure consumer access to the data by legitimated subject. Therefore, the account holding institution must not only be able to acquire at least the information on the legitimacy of the account information service provider that assesses the accounts, but also must know if the consent has been revoked so as to allow him to correctly fulfill the obligation to allow access to data only to legitimate subjects. It is precisely the need to keep the level of protection of the consumer right that could let us to reflect and further investigate the role of the of function of the certification issued to the account information service providers. Because at the time we could balance the need of keepness of the service and for certainty of legal situation. This implies, however, specific supervision by the certification bodies, not only on the technical data of safety and confidentiality of the distribution channels, but also on the existence of the consumer consent. And this not only in the pre-contractual pre phase, but also especially in the executive phase of the same. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you for your remarks, Cecilia, and for uh, your uh, funny presentation, too. <laughs> uh, uh, now we have uh, uh, only a uh, few minutes for a uh, um, short uh, question and intervention. From, from the floor, there is some question. If there, if there aren't, uh, uh, um, I um, want to, to say that I think that the legislator had not enough consideration of the risk for user and consequently also for the system. In fact, the protection of customer economic and financial data is left behind by the weak authorities for the protection of privacy and by this choice of the legislator and for the superficiality that almost always characterizes the user of, digi of digital technologies. In front, uh, in fact, there are uh, the, the big uh, um, uh, cross-border uh, operator of uh, the data, like uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple, uh, and so on, and uh, some operator uh, of China's uh, uh, part too. And this is, a, I think, it is a, a, a big question we have in front to resolve. Uh, I, I think we can close the, the session. Uh, what do you mean, uh, Marco? Yes, yes, it's been uh, it's been a long and productive day. I think. <laughs> We can we can stop here. Huh? Um, if um, I suppose the speakers will be there with us uh, tomorrow as well, and we will have a very broad uh, 
concluding session and nothing prevents us from taking uh, questions on uh, the flow of um, capitals tomorrow as well. So, uh, I mean, um, speakers themselves and uh, participants are free to think uh, during their evening overnight <laughs> and, and tomorrow early morning uh, about uh, po possible questions for tomorrow. Again, we designed the final session in, in a broad way, which will uh, enable everybody to take uh, issues from this session as well in the discussion. Thank you to all and uh, especially to the speakers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. See you later. See you the next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.